be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and every one that does he prunes so that it bears more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word that I spoke to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, because without me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me will be thrown out like a branch and wither. People will gather them and throw them into a fire, and they will be burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord There's so much power in uh, in this gospel passage, and uh, you know it contains uh, it contains within it some of the starkest uh, warnings and uh, the promise of the choicest blessings uh, that Jesus has on offer. We get that in. In the close of the passage, right? Anyone who does not remain in me will be thrown out like a branch and wither and the rest. And uh, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. So how do we, under- how do we understand this? We want to get to that kind of bold promise. We want to lay claim to that for ourselves. But how do we get there? Uh, well, first, I think we have to, we have to see this passage, um, say, not as the blank slate onto which we can write our stories. We want to see how Jesus is writing a story with a borrowed image. Uh, he uses the image here of a vine, and this is not the first time in scriptures that we encounter this image. We see it. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the Psalms, Psalm 80. Right? We hear you have you have plucked a vine. You have brought a vine out of Egypt, and to plant it, you have cleared out the nations. This is this is Israel's story. Right, so Israel's liberation from slavery in Egypt is caught up in this image of the vine in Psalm 80. And I think running alongside of that image, we see in the prophets a similar, a similar use, at least to make sure that we know Israel is the vine. Israel is God's vineyard. Israel is his chosen people. And we see in uh, the fifth, uh, the fifth uh, book, the fifth chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah, um, Israel as God's vineyard growing uh, wild grapes. Okay, so I want to I set that up and say what we, what we encounter here um, is much more forceful, I think, than we imagine. Because we encounter it as, say, a simple agricultural image. And say, okay, well, yeah, you know, vine dressing, you know, I know all about that, right? So you guys know all about vine dressing. That's not, that's not the thing. Well, we get it. Okay, we're branches on the vine. We're drawing life from Jesus. But it's more. It's more. Because, when, because Jesus, when he says this, uh, it's, it's offensive to certain ears. It's offensive to, it would be, sorry, it would be offensive to the, ear, to the ears of people who are not his followers. But here he's speaking to his disciples. When he says, I am the true vine, he's saying, I am the true Israel. I am the true Israel. Okay, so that's... That's frame number one. I'm sorry that I have to do it in steps today, but that's frame number one. Jesus is being the true vine. He is the true Israel. Okay, now reset. We'll start again. I know. I'm, I'm aware of the fact. I'm using time. We'll start again, okay? Th- that time counts as well. So let's start again. Here we see um, what we're in the season of Easter, okay? So what do, we, what do we celebrate in Easter? Let me tell the, let me tell the little story as, as, as best I can. God's world, God's world was made good. We hear it in the creation narrative. He saw that it was good. 
He saw that it was good, right? We hear that all the way through. He saw that it was very good, the creation of man on the sixth day. So God's good creation, and in his creation gone awry. From Adam and Eve on down, disorder, disharmony, injustice, idolatry, all the rest. Right? God, God's good creation is in a state of disorder. And then we say, well, what, what are you going to do about it, God? Right? If, if your creation is in a state of disorder, what do you want to do about it? Now, for us, our natural inclination is to say, well, you know, just scrap it, get rid of it, and start again. Right? This is our throwaway culture, as, as Pope Francis has decried, right? This, we, we're done with it. We have no use for it. Start again, get a better one, and that's it. That's not what God does. God, in that context, chooses a people to be his own, to restore, rejuvenate, revive his good creation. And the people that he chooses to be his own is Israel. And the Israel project is a project that God has established to bring his purposes to life, to fruition in the world. What does it mean? He wants Israel to be a light to the nations. He chooses Israel. They have no, they have no military strength. They have no power. They don't have the smarts beyond anybody else and all the rest. What they have is the choice of God to make them his people. So he chooses Israel, and precisely because they have no merits to plead their cause, he has mercy on them, and then they are to bring his mercy to life in the world. So God chooses Israel not to be blessed of themselves, as though they were the final destination of God's blessing. He chooses them to embody his blessing for the entire world. That's the promise of Israel. But we know it's a promise, right, that they, they can try to embody, try as they might. They get, they get stuck in their own ways. They can't, they can't get out of their own self-concern, their own self-absorption, their own self-indulgence. And if you go back and read, I encourage you to, if you go back and read that fifth chapter from the book of the prophet Isaiah, what you'll find is the wild grapes that Israel's growing, right, the reason why they can't produce the, the fruit that God intends them to produce is because they're producing the fruit of self-concern. They're producing the fruit of self-indulgence. And it's an abomination before God. So now we're in, in that context, the, God's good creation, creation gone awry. He's choosing Israel, and Israel not living up to the task. And then now Jesus, as the true Israel, to bring God's blessing to the world, his death and resurrection that sees that project come to the fore. Now, give me, let me give two more words here, two more words of context. Israel knew that they were failing. Israel knew they, could, they couldn't live up to the task. So then they imagined with God and in the voice of, of the prophets, they imagined a new age when holiness and justice would reign, when holiness and justice would overcome idolatry, the idolatry and injustice of the world. And that age would come when sin and death were dealt with, and they were living a new life on the other side of death, the resurrection. And that world, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, has taken root now. It's been inaugurated now. And to be implemented now in anticipation of that day of resurrection, when, when the project of God, the building of his kingdom, is drawn to completion. So we're in this in-between time. We're building for the kingdom of God. We want to see it come. The life of resurrection has entered our age. And we have access to it in anticipation of that, of that age to come. This now is where we get this, the thrust of the gospel passage. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. Jesus is the true Israel. And we, through and with and in him, 
are likewise branches on the vine that is Israel. We are made to be God's new Israel, God's new people in Jesus. And so we are called now to bring God's blessing to life. We're called to bring order out of the disorder of God's creation here and now. Okay, unless this sound too abstract for you, or too abstract for us. How do we do it? How do we go about doing it? How do we bring, how do we bring about, how do we participate in and bring about the new age? The age where God's kingdom of justice, of mercy, of peace, and all the rest is flourishing. We do it, my friends, by nothing other than love. By nothing other than love. We do it by participating in Jesus' own life, God's own life of love, made available to us in Christ Jesus and through his Holy Spirit at work in us and working through us. And that is the, but that's the task that's entrusted to us. We are to remain in Jesus. We are to draw on his own life of love to bring about God's rule, his kingdom, on earth as it is in heaven. And we'll do it by worship and mission. We'll do it by nothing other than love. Love of God. Loving God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength so that we can love our neighbor as ourselves. And this will be the way that God's entire creation is renewed and revived. And we play a central role as long as we remain on the vine. As long as we remain on the vine. Now let's look at the, these promises then, right? What, what do we have? We have got a promise. We got a, I don't know. There's, a, there's some word of condemnation in here. It's a, it's a kind of subtle word, right? When G, I mean, It's not too subtle the way he describes it. Anyone who does not remain in me will be thrown out like a branch and wither, right? Good for nothing. Can't bear fruit if we're not attached to the vine. And that's, it's a word of condemnation. It's a word of warning in the sense that what life do we have if we, if we do not have life in Christ? What are our lives meant to look like? Well, are my, our lives are participation in the Israel project in bringing God's blessing to life. We cannot bring God's blessing to life if we are not attached to Jesus. If our hearts, our lives, our minds are not centered on Jesus. And now, but now look at this. Ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. Ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. But I have to say, in the context of the Israel project, ask for, what, ask for whatever you want and it will be done. It will be given you. It will be done for you. What does that mean? It means that when our lives are rooted in Christ, when we find ourselves as branches on the vine, his purposes are our purposes. The meaning of our life is the meaning that he gives it. Each and every one of us, in our own way, but also then in the relationships that God has entrusted to our care, which means our, our families, say small groups, our community, whatever towns and, and the rest, our state, our nation, the world, all the rest, every, everything God, every relationship God has given us is a relationship in which we must embody the love and mercy of God. That's what he intends in every, every part of our life, every aspect of our life, we are to bring God's blessing to bear. It's a massive task. I mean, I hope that you experience it as that. That's over my head. How can, how, how can it be that I'd have any chance at, at being able to do that? The only chance you have, my friends, is to remain on the vine, to remain attached to Jesus because this is what God wants, and he will accomplish it. He has accomplished it in his son, and he will accomplish it in and through Jesus' faithful followers. And in the context of that mission that he has given us to bring his blessing to bear in the world, he says, everything you ask will be given you. Everything you ask of God in order to, to live your life of vocation, Everything you ask of God in order to help you 
bring his love to bear in the world will be given you. How often do we come up against it and we think, we, probably, we may not think this, right? But I don't know, I can't love. I can't love here. I can't love him or her or them or whatever. And we may not express it like that, but we know what our, we know we've had that experience in our hearts. I give up. I give up. There's no giving up in Christ. There's no giving up in Christ. And we could fail and fall short. It's part of our story. But there's no giving up in Christ. He's always there. God is always there with the strength of his own life of love to help us persevere in a test that he's entrusted to us. You just have to keep going to him, begging him, asking for the strength that we need to do so. And my friends, he gives it to us in spades. He gives it to us abundantly, his own blessed life. I mean, you need no reminder. We're gathered around, we're gathered around the Eucharistic table. Here we eat and drink Jesus' own life of love. We eat and drink his own flesh and blood so that we can become his flesh and blood in the world. This is our, it's our task. It's our vocation. It's our call. It's our life. And we won't find the meaning and purpose that God intends for us to find anywhere else. But it's ours now to give ourselves over to God. In the perfect offering of Christ Jesus here at the altar, as we offer ourselves through and with and in Jesus to God our Father, we will receive the strength that we need to live out this life of blessing that he intends us to live, to be a blessing to everyone we encounter.